and welcome to the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Task Force Virtual Town Hall. Today we'll be covering the status of COVID-19 and monkeypox and have some updates on health and safety protocols at UCLA. So thanks very much for joining us today. So I'm Megan McAvoy, professor in the Institute for Society and Genetics and the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Molecular Genetics, and also the co-chair of the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Task Force. I'm joined here today by Michael Beck, the Administrative Vice Chancellor and the Task Force Co-Chair. Today, we're gonna to have three brief presentations and then we'll devote the rest of the hour to answering questions. The first presentation will be a COVID-19 update by Dr. Peter Katona. And then we'll have Michelle Sityar, the Chief of Staff to the Administrative Vice Chancellor who will give an update on COVID-19 protocols for the fall. Then we have Dr. Annabelle de St. Maurice who will give an update on monkeypox. In addition to these presenters, we also have Luby Levin, Associate Vice Chancellor in Campus Human Resources as a panelist on hand to help answer questions. So before we go further, I have a, just a few housekeeping items to go over. This town hall is being recorded and will be available on the UCLA YouTube channel, as well as accessible via the UCLA COVID-19 website. Um, and I wanna say we appreciate all the questions we've received uh, in advance for the town hall today. For answers to questions that we're not able to get to during the town hall, the questions and the answers will be posted on the UCLA COVID-19 website. For those participating via Zoom that would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function, not chat. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible during our town hall today. So again, I'm glad that you could all join us today. I hope that many of you have been able to get a few moments break over the summer, have had a chance to refresh and regroup after the challenges of the past couple of years. I know it's clear to all of you that we're still facing challenges from COVID and it's likely there will be other infectious diseases that will require attention in the years to come. But hopefully we can look back on what we've done over the last couple of years and learn from our situation, how to more effectively manage the challenges that we've experienced and hopefully we'll minimize disruptions in the future. But it's clear that a pandemic response requires a coordinated effort, not just from scientists, but also from community and individuals as well. And I think we've all learned that we each have something to contribute through our individual responses, as well as looking out for those around us. And so I'm hopeful that as we head into the fall term, we'll be in a better place from a public health perspective than we have been in recent past, but also in public spirit. And I wanna thank you for your concern in this matter, which is clear from your participation in today's town hall. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Katona, Clinical Professor of Medicine, David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and Adjunct Professor of Public Health. Peter, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Megan. I'm going to start by asking the question, um, are many of us looking at COVID-19 through the rearview mirror? Because we shouldn't be. We're kind of reaching an, an endemic state with some degree of always having some infection around, worrisome being that there's reinfection possible because of immunity issues. And it's kind of changed our risk tolerance to a different pivot point than we used to have. Historically, we've gone from a deadly, less contagious disease without a vaccine to a less harmful but more contagious disease in a mostly vaccinated population. If there's transmission, then what precautions are needed? Well, there is data on the benefits of masking both indoors versus outdoors, one way versus two way, surgical versus M95. We have a lot of information about foot ventilation and its importance with HEPA filtration, the room size, occupancy, the numbers of people in the room and how long they're in the room. There's a lot of good news in various aspects. We have a new hybrid vaccine that's imminent. Cases and deaths are dropping globally. We have an expanded armamentarium of therapeutics. And mostly, but not always, we're seeing mild disease. We've dropped surveillance testing, going to testing mostly with uh, rapid tests, which are almost as accurate as PCR, but not quite there. We uh, have quarantine and isolation protocols that are ever-changing. And we've been haunted by fake news and anti-vaxxer influence. Sites known to spread misleading or false medical information dramatically outperform reliable sources on social media. And hopefully at some point this will change. So there's a balancing act between the epidemiology, the transmission and the social business aspects of our economy. Mild infection dominates, but some, especially in the unvaccinated can get very sick. 
and there's long COVID, and there are kids who rarely get an immune impairment issue. Most of us want to go forget and move on from this. And on the campus, there is still a vaccination mandate, but no mandates for indoor masking, surveillance testing, symptom monitoring, pretty much in line with what we have from LA County and state of California and CDC. We have a good wastewater surveillance program, which theoretically can be done for both buildings and community sewage sites. Um, but we're doing dorms individually sampled. We collect the specimens from high viral loads. We do geospatial mapping of the positives. We sequence all of our positives. And what's important to understand here is we can use this to look for current cases, and we can also look to see where the actual outbreak is headed. And, and that's an easy way to do that without having to do the whole population of students, faculty, and staff. Some will argue that masks are overemphasized, but the data shows that in the right circumstances, indoors and crowded places, um, they do have a beneficial effect. But we have to ask the question, what's the difference in effectiveness between a mandate and a strong recommendation? And how are we gonna police it if we have mandates? Vaccinations certainly have been proven to work. Um, we're all tested to prevent symptomatic disease, not transmission, which sometimes confuses people. We have a primary series, boosters, and now, now this new hybrid formulations that our students, faculty, and staff will qualify for age-wise. Omicron variants are going to continue to happen, hopefully not to a very large degree to have us reconsider our, our, <clears throat> our procedures. CDC is in a current revamp, reorganizing. And note that every administration change at CDC comes with a change in bureaucracy. But there are legitimate complaints to CDC. It's been slow developing the first test, too academic, wishy-washy. Guidance has been confusing and overwhelming. because It was a poor initial understanding of aerosol spread and the need for masks. But it also developed these county criteria for both transmission and severity, which have been in place and seem to be working county by county. Mandates are changing. CDC's gotten away from social distancing, quarantine, the test to stay in schools. They're starting to move to a 48 hour testing between tests. So they come out with a new formula, which involves four parts, developing special forces to fight future epidemics, translate science into practical, easy to understand policy, share scientific findings and data faster, and regain that trust that was lost throughout this outbreak. So there are more questions than answers. Nobody knows, despite the popularity of the surge is imminent in the fall rhetoric, but will new, new variants come around? Will there be a new hybrid vaccine that will work? Can businesses, supply chains, employments grow and prosper? How will we handle long COVID because there's millions of people inflicted with this and we have no effective treatment yet? So in the fall, there's gonna be an adding of past infection, easy reinfection and vaccination, especially with boosters and the new vaccine, giving us a kind of herd immunity that might give us a universal mild disease if we're lucky. The new vaccine is not necessarily a surge, but a surge is imminent. What will it take? to handle three currently coexisting vaccine preventable diseases and do they influence each other? I'll take the next slide, please. Here's a slide of the three contagious diseases that are on the on the news lately. And there are differences and similarities, but they shouldn't be confused with each other. The asymptomatic rate is much different in the three. Uh, illness severity is different in the three. Uh, contagiousness is, is, is slightly different. Transmission is very different. Long-term consequences are also very different as is the mutation rate and the hospitalization rate. So I just wanted to end with this so that we have an idea of there, the fact that there are differences with, the, with these three contagious 
viral diseases. So I'll, with that, I'll hand it back to Megan. Thank you so much, Peter, for that, um, uh, for your work, kind words. Um, next, we have Michelle Sityar, Chief of Staff to the Administrative Chancellor, who will talk about COVID protocols. Michelle. Thanks so much, Megan. And good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope everybody has been enjoying the summer and looking forward to a positive fall quarter. I'm happy to be here today to provide you all with an overview of the recent COVID-19 protocol changes that we announced and also to answer any questions that you might have during the Q&A section. So in light of case rates, test positivity rates, and other relevant metrics improving both in LA County and at UCLA, we have made some changes to, to some bar mitigation strategies. Effective August 15th, we reverted to a strong recommendation for indoor masking and this applies to all, regardless of vaccine status. It is still required under certain narrow conditions, such as when one is leaving isolation or quarantine early, and also in spaces where LACDPH still requires that masks be worn, such as hospital settings, which does apply to UCLA. We are still making upgraded masks uh, free of charge um, available through our emergency PPE store and throughout campus locations such as the bookstore, the residence halls, Wooden Center, to name a few. Another major change that we've made is to symptom screening. Also effective August 15th, we discontinued the requirement to complete the online symptom monitoring survey. However, individuals are still required to self-screen for symptoms and must continue to adhere to building signage, which indicates you must not enter the facility if you have symptoms or are ill. We still have tests available through the vending machines free of charge through the UCLA community. And as a reminder, anybody who tests positive either through the UCLA program or through a community test site must still report that to the appropriate COVID-19 hotline. Just as a note, these changes do not apply to UCLA health staff who must continue to follow protocols for health care and must continue to complete the symptom tracker for UCLA Health. These changes only apply to the campus at this time. I wanted to take an opportunity to also review with you the new COVID-19 Action Center, which is an online tool that has recently been developed, which kind of serves as a hub that streamlines all the specific actions you may need to take in line with existing COVID-19 protocols. The difference between this and the symptom survey is that the Action Center is not a daily requirement. This is something that you would visit on a need basis. So now, when you click on the link that used to route to the symptom survey, you'll be taken to the landing page for the Action Center. You'll still be asked to log in based on your affiliation. And then you'll be given a menu list of options that you can complete through the application, such as uploading your vaccine proof or requesting an exception to the policy changing your remote status, updating your privacy settings if you wish to request anonymity from our case dashboard. This is also where you would go to upload a test result if asked to do so by our exposure management team. And a new feature is this button here, learn what I need to do to come to a UCLA site, which allows you to navigate all of the existing written protocols available on the COVID-19 website. This is tied to the FAQs and the written documents, so there is consistency in the information that is shared through the technology. At the end of all of that, you still have questions that were not addressed by the application, be given information about the appropriate phone number to call, depending on the affiliation you selected at the beginning. And you'll also be reminded about our general COVID-19 inbox that my office monitors in case you have any general inquiries. The isolation and quarantine protocol has not changed. It still remains for those who test positive and must isolate, uh, and also for those who were exposed to an infected individual and become symptomatic, in which case those individuals must quarantine. Now, though, you are able to log into the Action Center to request anonymity in case you are the ones uh, who test positive for COVID-19. So this is tied to the daily email that we receive, which is UCLA's obligation to inform its uh, community members anytime there is a positive COVID-19 case at the workplace. This email links out to our case dashboard, which provides information on who tested positive, 
the dates that they were on site during the infectious period, and also the locations that were visited by those individuals. So again, if you are the one who tests positive, the exposure management team will instruct you to visit the action center to update your privacy settings, and then you'll be able to either indicate that your personal information can be disclosed on the dashboard or de-identified, uh, in which case your name and payroll title will be removed prior to the dashboard being published that day. So in the past, this was taken care of through the symptom survey, but now with the Action Center, you only need to log on if you're the one who tests positive and needs to make these designations. In terms of the system-wide vaccine program policy, this also remains in effect, which requires that faculty, staff, and students who are living, learning, or working on UC properties to provide proof of vaccine and boosters or to request an exception to the policy. Now through the Action Center, for those of you who have been fully remote up to this point and are just returning for the first time um, for fall quarter or at any point during the academic year, you will need to come to the Action Center to change your remote status to either in-person or hybrid work or learning. In line with that, in order to have a physical presence on UC properties, you will also then be asked to provide proof of vaccine and booster or request an exception, exception as previously mentioned. So all of these can be taken care of through the technology. There have been questions about whether we will be requiring the second booster. At this time, we are still in the process of figuring out what that implementation plan will look like and the system-wide policy is currently under revision. So when those two things align, we'll make sure to communicate that to the Bruin community. So as much as we had hoped COVID would go away by now, it's quite evident that it's here to stay and we're living with COVID. And with that, the protocols continue to evolve and we understand that that can be a pretty complicated process to follow. So we have established a new COVID-19 table summary that is kind of your one-stop shop to all of the existing protocols and provides a, a snapshot of what you need to know based on your affiliation and your vaccine status and the information that you are looking to gather. So I encourage you to visit our protocols website. It's the first link on that list. And hopefully this will be a helpful resource to all of you. So thanks again for everything that you've been doing to keep up with all of the changes here at UCLA. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have in Q&A, uh, but for now I'll turn it back over to Megan. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was terrific. All that information was very helpful. Um, next, we have Dr. Annabelle de St. Maurice, Associate Professor of Pediatric Infectious Diseases and Co-Chief Infection Prevention Officer in UCLA Health. So Annabelle, to you. Thanks. All right, thank you everyone for having me. I'm gonna give a brief overview of monkeypox virus. A lot of the details will be shared with you in the slides. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights and happy to answer any questions, including the ones that have already come up. As far as the current outbreak, these are data from CDC that um, were published uh, last week. It hasn't been updated. However, um, you can see that most of the cases that we are seeing worldwide are occurring in Europe and in the Americas, with the United States having the highest number of cases. As far as the modes of transmission, uh, for those cases where uh, transmission was documented and known exposure was documented. Uh, they, this graph represents the different encounters in which individuals were thought to have uh, gotten infected. Predominantly, you can see that most cases reported a sexual encounter as their uh, likely mode of contact. However, there are cases that have um, certainly uh, spread through other means, including person to person, um, fewer cases that to be transmitted through contaminated material, and to date only one case that is uh, healthcare associated. This is data for Los Angeles County specifically. As of yesterday, there were 1,209 cases, most of them occurring in men, about 98%. And most of the cases occurring in individuals who are less than age 50 and usually age uh, 18 to uh, 50. As far as demographics in terms of race and ethnicity, most of the cases have occurred in Latino, Hispanic, or white um, individuals in Los Angeles County. 
With regards to the clinical overview, the incubation period on average is about 7 to 14 days, but can be as long as 21 days. Typically, there's a prodromal period, which is marked by fever, malaise, headache, or weakness, kind of a nonspecific viral syndrome. And then that uh, prodrome can be followed by lymphadenopathy or lymph node swelling, which can occur at the site where an individual was infected um, and can appear with a fever in a couple of days before the rash appears. The important thing to remember is that these uh, cases have all had a very low fat fatality rate. This is just a description. Uh, I apologize that the, the wording got a little bit cut off on the left, but this is just uh, pic pictures of the rash evolution over time. And you can see it kind of starts sort of like a little papule or almost like a pimple, and then um, can form these sort of um, umbilicated uh, lesions, which then can become uh, scabbed and heal over time. And an individual is in considered infectious until a new layer of skin has formed under the scab. As far as transmission, transmission uh, from human to human occurs primarily through respiratory droplets or direct contact with uh, any of these lesions or body fluids. The um, virus is typically spread through respiratory droplets that don't travel um, more than a few feet and usually requires prolonged face-to-face -face contact. So just as Dr. Katona mentioned in his presentation, this is much, much, much less contagious than uh, COVID-19. It can also enter the bro through broken skin um, or the mucous membranes, um, and this is why uh, transmission uh, has occurred during sex because there's close skin-to-skin -skin contact and other intimate contact. And a recent CDC study uh, looked at household cleaning in two cases who had been infected with monkeypox and found that routine disinfection and uh, of commonly touched surfaces and objects appeared to really uh, render the virus no longer infectious. So even though they detected the virus on some of these surfaces, they were not able to culture any infectious virus. So this is all very uh, reassuring. As far as complications, they uh, the monkeypox um, cases have had a very low fatality rate as part of this outbreak. This outbreak is uh, apologies for that um, is a, is part of plate two, um, where there's reduced transmissibility and it's less virulent. One second, sorry. Apologies for that. Um, and uh, there are uh, these lesions tend to be more localized and are in areas uh, associated with direct contact um, with infected individuals. So, for example, as part of this outbreak, most of the cases of sexual transmission have occurred in the genital or perianal area. And most of the cases in the United States have been mild and self limited. Some cases have required hospitalization. Frequently, that's just for. Um, administration of pain medications. As far as treatment, there is treatment available, but typically most patients just require supportive care. Uh, T-pox is one treatment that's FDA approved for smallpox. And currently um, there are no human data for monkeypox, but animal studies are favorable and there are clinical trials that will be uh, started soon to look at the efficacy of T-pox in uh, humans infected with monkeypox. Because um, this treatment is um, investigational, it's available through the strategic national stockpile um, and is available through UCLA's IRB. And we will be uh, a site for um, the clinical trial as well. There's also post-exposure prophylaxis that's available um, through immunization. So just briefly, the, there are two smallpox vaccines that are live vaccines. The uh, smallpox vaccine that had been given historically is the ACAM 200, but that's not currently used because of safety con concerns. So the current vaccine that is being used as part of this outbreak is the Genios vaccine, and it has much fewer adverse effects, but its supply is very limited. So uh, it is really only being used for selected high-risk persons as defined by public health. And it does not have a role in treatment, but is given to individuals after they've been exposed to monkeypox and is also given to individuals who are at high risk of being exposed to monkeypox. 
can be given um, after exposure, as I mentioned, ideally within four days, but can be given as late as 14 days after exposure in order to reduce uh, symptom risk. And as I mentioned, it really is uh, limited in supply. We do have some supply at UCLA for certain high risk uh, individuals. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions after. Thank you so much, Annabelle. That was very helpful. And also thank you again to uh, Peter and Michelle for your presentations. For everyone on the call, if you're interested in reviewing the presentation slides more closely, um, they will be posted on the COVID-19 website along with the video of the town hall. Um, the video of the town hall will also be on UCLA's YouTube channel, and these should be available no later than tomorrow. So now we'll move into the more specific question and answer portion of the town hall. We'll try to answer as many of the questions submitted ahead of the town hall, as well as those submitted via the Q&A function for those on Zoom. So just a reminder, please don't use chat, but use the Q&A function. So I'll kick off the Q&A uh, session with a question for uh, Michelle. Um, a couple of questions have popped up about whether departments will have the option to require masking in their space in consideration of the continued rise of new COVID variants and the recent BA5 surge. Or will individual instructors be able to require that students in their classes wear masks? Michelle? Thanks for that question, which we have received pretty often. Uh, departments and faculty are not permitted to create their own masking requirements in spaces or in classrooms that deviate from the current protocols that we have for UCLA. And this is important because these strategies need to be applied consistently and equitably across all campus entities. The decision to revert to a strong recommendation for indoor masking was made in line with LACDPH guidance and, of course, in consultation with public health experts, epidemiologists, many on this call, uh, and other institutes of higher education. So this was not made in a vacuum. Um, in terms of options, you have specific options um, in terms of if you have a medical condition that warrants additional protections and needs to wear a highly protective mask including an N95 respirator, those accommodation requests can be submitted through insurance and risk management for faculty and staff or through CAE for students. Uh, we're also in the process of outfitting more classrooms with Zoom capabilities and maintaining faculty Zoom assistance for fall quarter. So these efforts combined should provide options for those who test positive or were otherwise exposed and need to quarantine, which will benefit the safety of others in the classroom setting specifically. Uh, and finally, I was just um, informed that we have confirmed that we are able to hold voluntary use N95 fit testing sessions in September. This is something that we did in spring quarter and we will do again uh, for fall returns. So for those who wish to consult with a professional about proper N95 mask seal and use, these sessions will be available. So more information on those specific dates will be announced closer to the date. Ah, terrific. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I guess Michael and I are going to tag team some Q&A questions. So Michael, do you want to uh, pose a question? Certainly, thank you. Uh, with the change in the way that monkeypox vaccine is being administered, will there be testing to confirm whether the vaccine has had the necessary result? And I'm uh, going to turn to Annabelle for that. Yeah, I think with regards to the vaccine efficacy, there are follow-up studies through public health to see what um, and how the, the vaccine is protecting against illness. It's still recommended uh, for individuals who are vaccinated to continue to um, be aware of the risks of monkeypox because the efficacy, um, you know, is really, the data for the efficacy are really limited. Um, so uh, it's not likely going to be uh, you know, exactly 100%. Um, and there are breakthrough cases that have been reported. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, I'm going to pose a question to Luby. Uh, the question was posed, what is the telecommute policy moving forward? Re resume fully in person? Hybrid can respective departments make their own arrangements based on job nature and department needs? Thank you, Megan, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this question comes up a lot. Uh, organizations and departments on campus continue to have the flexibility to determine which positions can be approved for hybrid or remote work, uh, as well as flexible schedules, uh, depending on the nature of the work. 
And I know that many departments on campus are currently evaluating their operational and service needs to make these determinations. So we'd be happy to respond to any specific questions, but our uh, policy on flex work uh, will continue to be intact during the fall and on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luby. Michael, would you like to? Certainly, I have a, uh, you want me to go for another question? Perfect, I have a question for you, Megan. And that's, uh, are professors required to post videos of lectures for students? Okay, um, no students are not, or excuse me, instructors are not required to post videos for students, but um, instructors have been encouraged to be accommodating as, as accommodating as they can be um, for their students' educational experience. But how that uh, takes shape um, will be decided sort of on an individual basis. I think that uh, over the last couple of years, we have had a number of instructors take advantage of uh, uh, recording their lectures or making simultaneous Zoom sessions. Um, and I think we've learned a lot about how to do that uh, seamlessly. For some classes, it's simply not practical to to, to do those things. And hopefully other accommodations will be made for students that have to miss class um, for COVID, for monkeypox, for any other things that may come up in their lives. So. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead with another question then, Michael, is that okay? Or do you wanna... Sounds great. Okay, um, Michelle, there were a couple questions. I'm gonna to toss this one to you. Questions about food and indoor spaces. So the questions, will, will the guidelines or recommendations be for indoor gatherings, especially when there will be food? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't cover that in my presentation. So thanks for selecting that one. Uh, we did recently modify the protocol for organized events, which contains the current rules. Um, so basically uh, events that occur on campus need to follow the masking protocols that we have in place for the entire community, which is to strongly recommend but not require masking. Um, so to that end, food and drink are permitted in departmental meetings as well as events on campus. Um, and additionally, in case there are other questions about what to do with events, I wanted to mention that organizers still do have the option to request uh, proof of vaccine or negative test upon entry to an event and just um, just to clarify, an event is something that is optional attendance, not required attendance. Uh, the difference here is we're no longer using the symptom monitoring survey to do these pre-entry checks and it will now need to follow the LA County Department of Public Health guidelines for verifying at the door. And then I have a, a question, I believe for, uh, for Peter. And is it UCLA's po uh, official policy to accept, accept some level of COVID indemnicity among the campus community? Well, thank you, Michael. It's a hard question to answer because indemnicity is, is not one thing. It can be a whole spectrum of things from having virtually nothing happen more than a cold to having continued long COVID and and more end organ damage from COVID. So, so it's, it's, we all agree that there's going to be some kind of endemicity, but how it actually evolves, how it happens, how long it takes to happen, or what it does in the long run is still very much uncertain. Thanks, Peter. Um, Annabelle, this is a question for you. Uh, the question came in, how will we know if we're eligible for a monkeypox vaccine and where do we check for vaccine availabilities? Yeah, so currently, the as I mentioned, the LA County Department of Public Health uh, has provided the recommendations for who should get monkeypox vaccine and it's through their website, so I'll share it in the chat um, so that individuals can access that data. Um, but it is based off of um, whether or not an individual is high risk. And I'll share it in the chat. And it also includes information about where the vaccine can be obtained within LA County. Perfect, I think I'm up. And this is, a, I think, another question for you, Annabelle, uh, or Peter is, is, can you get infected with monkeypox and COVID-19 at the same time? 
and uh, how how you how uh, how a second <laughs> and can you basically said can you get the COVID and the flu simultaneously? Does that make sense? Similarly, can you get COVID and monkeypox similarly to getting the COVID and the flu simultaneously? I don't know if that if that makes sense. Sure, I, I can uh, tackle this one. You can uh, certainly get co-infection with flu and COVID that's been very much reported. And there, um, I've read of at least one case of monkeypox and COVID, but certainly you can be at risk of viral co-infection. I don't know if you have anything to add, Peter. What I would add is that uh, the thinking is that once you get infected with something, your immune system is revved up. There are specific immune system attributes and there are general ones. And the general ones kind of get activated. So it's it's difficult to get infected with more than one virus, but certainly possible, but it doesn't happen very often. Okay, thank you so much, Annabelle and Peter. Um, Michelle, a uh, question for you. Is the university willing to reinstate comprehensive masking if the case numbers reach a certain threshold? And how do we know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are continuing to monitor conditions with LA County as well as our partner institutions. And we are still utilizing the LACDPH post-surge plan, which is based off of the CDC community risk level metrics to make these determinations about the layered uh, mitigation strategy. And on top of that, we have a more specific document, which is the UCLA COVID-19 pivot plan, which we monitor weekly. And we disseminate that to our case management team each week and make determinations based on the metrics that are calculated for that period. So if for some reason, which we hope not, because it is a positive outlook, if for some reason there is a pivot that is warranted for fall quarter, whether that be uh, you know, increasing cases at UCLA or LA County at large or some other unforeseen issue, then yes, we are definitely uh, in a good position to reinstate not only masking, but other mitigation strategies as appropriate. Great, and then Annabelle or Peter, uh, when will the new Pfizer booster dose uh, be available that'll address the, the new variants? Their publicity, their marketing has told us that it should be within two or three weeks. Um, I don't know whether there'll be some snafus that'll extend that, but uh, Moderna and Pfizer are both coming out with theirs. One is for over 18 and one is over 17. So it should include the university community as a, as a target. Great, thank you. Annabelle, anything, any uh, additional information? Perfect, thank you. Actually, Michael, then this might be a good time to ask if there are any um... Uh, vaccination clinics that UCLA will host, um, and will this cover the new COVID vaccine? So there is a plan for a uh, both a flu and a COVID vaccination clinic in October uh, that'll be available for uh, faculty and staff. And uh, certainly the uh, the plan is to have uh, the new uh, vaccine iterations available if if they're available in mass to be distributed, but that's uh, the current plans. Annabelle, anything to add from the health system side of things? No. Mm -mm. And then students will be uh, available, students will have the availability to get those uh, through ASH. And uh, next question would be, what provisions will be available throughout the coming year for community members who want or need to be isolated from COVID-19? And so this is probably a question for Lou because I don't think they're referring to uh, uh, isolation space as much as being, uh, being able to separate themselves from uh, potential exposure. Uh, so that I think that's the intent of the question. So I'll turn to Lou on that. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, we uh, are recommending the protocols that have been used all along. Um, and although the masking requirement 
uh, is being relaxed, although it's still strongly recommended. Uh, I, I think the current processes are in place to make sure people are safe uh, and that the protocols are followed. So I don't know if you have any more specific questions on that. No, I think that's helpful. And then just as a quick reminder, if individuals uh, uh, require a medical accommodation, there is a process uh, for, for submitting the, the medical documentation for an accommodation that may, in, uh, uh, may include additional mitigations uh, to protect them from uh, contracting the virus if it's medically appropriate based on the risks of them contracting the virus. Yes, that exception process is, continues to be available. Thanks so much. Um, this was covered uh, partially in the monkeypox uh, discussion, but I wanted to return to some more pointed questions. We had questions about, um, do people need to worry about monkeypox if they will never have sexual relationships with other people with monkeypox? And about transmissibility, would a brief hug or shaking hands spread monkeypox? How transmissible is monkeypox through contact with gym equipment? Things like metal barbells, dumbbells, ropes, and vinyl seats. They can uh, go first. So as far as transmission through fomites, I'll, I'll take that question first. Um, like things like equipment or uh, dumbbells, things like that. It Based on that one study by CDC of the household and other um, sort of basic science data that has come out, it seems as though routine disinfection will likely uh, render the virus no longer infectious. We would recommend before you use any gym equipment, um, you know, continuing to, to wipe it down as we all have been doing throughout the pandemic. As far as transmissibility outside of sexual encounters, it can occur through any close skin to skin contact. So um, it, it is not, as um, has been mentioned in the chat, just transmitted through sexual encounters. It can be transmitted through prolonged face-to-face um, -face contact. But again, you know, it's not as transmissible as COVID. We aren't seeing um, cases uh, spreading quickly throughout the uh, community. So we're continuing to, to monitor it. Um, and um, was the other part of the question, Megan? It was specifically a brief hug or shaking hands with that spread monkeypox. Yeah, typically not, no. Um, I just wanna follow then this discussion with asking um, if you can comment on UCLA's uh, monkeypox preparedness plan. And I can start um, to comment on it. And Michelle, I don't uh, would be also helpful if you added some um, information as well. But we have uh, created a preparedness plan around any cases that might be identified on campus and guidelines around disinfection, isolation, uh, and uh, testing. Um, and Michelle, I don't know if there's any other further comments you want to to share. But we we do have preparedness plans in place. Yeah, um, so what Annabelle is talking about is kind of the, I believe, the infectious disease plan that we are working on through UCLA's health counterparts. But apart from that, we also have cleaning and disinfection protocols that are being finalized now through facilities management, housing and hospitality, and environment health and safety, which will apply to all of our custodial teams that will be servicing the isolation and quarantine rooms pertaining to monkeypox cases. Uh, we are also working with the um, Office of the President on a monkeypox guidance, sorry, guidance and checklist. Um, so hopefully there will be some alignment across the various campuses on this. More information on that will be shared in September. And uh, do we anticipate any changes to COVID protocol protocols for the fall quarter? Uh, past trends show that there is an increase in cases at the start of winter quarter. And uh, they, so uh, I'll turn over to uh, Michelle to start the answer to that one. Thanks, Michael. Um, I mean, I think what we have communicated today is what we anticipate will be in place a few weeks from now. But again, as I mentioned earlier, if there's any conditions that warrant a pivot or some type of substantive change, the university is prepared to make those changes to our mitigation strategy. And we'll make sure to communicate it very well in advance so it's not so much whiplash to our community. And since I have you, just really quickly, Michelle, 
Uh, does UCLA require students to get a booster or are two vaccines enough to attend classes and events? Yeah, I think I might have answered that in the live yep. chat, um, but just to reiterate, uh, we have not yet established a timeline or enforcement schedule for booster number two. Right now, we are still tracking the primary vaccine series and booster number one, but we do have several operational teams discussing an implementation plan for uh, booster number two and beyond. So um, we plan to make that information public once the system-wide policy is revised, we're just trying to keep in line with the timeline. Thanks. Um, Michelle, there were a number of questions around testing. Um, and the question is, the questions are about how long the PCR tests will be available through vending machines. Um, and are there, is there any availability of free rapid test kits for home use? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we we currently still have PCR tests available through the vending machines, as you all know, to anybody who has uh, a brewing card. Um, so we, we have not yet discussed the plan to, uh, or a timeline to discontinue the availability of those PCR tests. Uh, there are um, rapid antigen tests available at various uh, resource, resources throughout the community, including through your personal um, care physician, uh, we do have a short supply here at UCLA to have to circle back with what that looks like, um, but those are really for special use cases and subject to approval by the task force before distribution. Thank you. And what would uh, monkeypox isolation look like for students living on campus or in shared apartments? I'm not sure if that's for Michelle or Peter. Why don't you go ahead and give it a, a whirl, and then uh, I'll fill in if I'm if we miss. Sure. Um, can you repeat the question, Michael? Yeah, certainly. Uh, what would be the monkeypox isolation look like for students living on campus or in uh, shared apartments? Got it. So right now, the plan is to provide at least temporary isolation spaces for uh, monkeypox cases that occur within our community. The Isolation period for monkeypox is a lot longer than COVID-19, so we're looking at anywhere from four to six weeks. And you know, for the benefit of the student, it's probably best that they be, uh, you know, either sent back home um, while be being given proper accommodations to um, support their educational um, pursuits, right? So uh, other accommodations to to, to be able to attend class. Um, we have yet to establish what this is exactly going to look like, and we are working with ASH and the public health experts to solidify those plans. And this is a good opportunity now to mention that there will be a separate student town hall that we will hold in September closer to first day of instruction. So more information that is, is forthcoming. Peter, anything to add? I think it's important to emphasize that monkeypox is going to have a much less degree of need for isolation facilities. And the fact that we can send these people home makes it even less. So it's going to be a much bigger you know, issue for COVID when COVID was actually peaking than it is going to be for monkeypox at this point. Michael, could you go ahead with another question? Certainly. Yep. Uh, if you've been vaccinated against smallpox, would you need this new vaccine for monkeypox, uh, Annabelle or Peter? Well, there's not much data. I mean, it, the thinking is that the, the, the viruses are so similar that the vaccine for one will, will probably be effective for the other, and that's the assumption. But there's no real, real data on, on, on proving that that's the case. Great, thank you. And then Peter, do you mind just currently covering uh, briefly the current COVID case rates, hospitalizations, death rates? Are they increasing or dis decreasing? And is another surge expected this fall or winter? Well, globally cases are 
are starting to come down, deaths are starting to come down globally. When we fine tune that to LA County, we're seeing pretty much of a plateau of cases. Now with all the home testing that's being done, it's hard to know what that means because so much more testing is done at home and unreported than we actually get out of LA County's data. So well, how that translates into what happens in the fall is, is very, very difficult to estimate. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, a surge is imminent in the fall is something that's a conjecture more than a fact. Um, and I do think that the new vaccine that's coming out, this hybrid vaccine that will have the original Wuhan strain as well as the BA4 and BA5 strains all in one mixture in a vaccine has the potential to kind of be a disruptor of the virus to an extent we have never seen before. So I'm cautiously optimistic that that will be more important than these projections of imminent surge that have been pushed in. Thank you, Peter. Um, Michael, I'm gonna direct a question to you. There are a number of questions about UCLA masking uh, protocols and decision-making process. Um, so could you, could I please ask why UCLA has lifted the masking requirement? Could you please address that? Yeah, that's a great question. I noticed there are a number of those in the live chat as, as well. And it's important to note that uh, any of the mitigations that we implement, uh, undertake, are designed to respond to uh, varying degrees of, of the uh, severity of the virus, not just simply the number, uh, the act pure number of cases. But since Los Angeles County and other areas around UCLA uh, did uh, loosen the requirements and uh, pivoted to simply highly recommending it back all the way back in March. Uh, it was determined that it was that we were actually doing the campus a disservice because of the lack of our ability to enforce masking uh, in an effort to uh, have just masking required on the campus when you can walk off campus or anywhere else in LA County and there's no masking requirement and our inability ultimately to enforce that and uh, wanting to make sure that when LA County or it becomes uh, an, uh, critically important for us to be masking on the campus or in LA County and we reinstitute, need to reinstitute the masking requirement that it is a clear message uh, and that uh, people understand that uh, it's important during those particular periods of time. Uh, the Compliance in a lot of these mitigation measures has continued to wane as as uh, people become uh, tired of them, and we do recognize the fact that individuals who want to continue to, to provide personal protection uh, do have some options, including uh, wearing an N95 mask uh, if if they would like. And I'd also say that these are not uh, unanimous uh, decisions of the. Uh, task force or of the uh, case management team. Uh, these are highly debated and uh, there's, uh, I would say there's probably no uh, perfect answer. So we do what we think is best uh, for the campus population. Uh, Peter or Annabelle, how, lo how long does the vaccine booster offer protection against COVID? Well, it depends on which booster and it depends on um, when you get it and how long you've waited between the boosters. Uh, the actual prevention of transmission by a booster is a very brief period of time, of probably a few weeks, if at all. It's the prevention of the significant morbidities that, that is at issue here. And whether or not somebody should get the second booster if they haven't gotten it yet, or whether they should get the new hybrid booster is a question that comes up all the time and one has to kind of decide whether you want something that's been around for a while or you want something that's new and maybe more potent. Great, thank you, Peter. And uh, before we conclude the town hall today, I want to thank our presenters and our Q&A panelists for participating and really for all that they are doing to help support the campus uh, community during this challenging time. I also want to provide a special call out and thank you to Megan McAvoy 
for her service over the past year as the co-chair of the task force. It's hard to believe that the one year of her service or sentence, depending on how you interpret it, uh, will will conclude at the end of this month. And I'm just incredibly grateful for her partnership, advice, and assistance over this past year. I will miss working with you, Megan, um, and uh, we'll uh, welcome a new academic senate leader to assist us as we enter into the third new academic year under COVID. But uh, thank you very much, Megan. We also want to thank all of you who uh, joined the live stream and for those who sent in your questions. Hopefully you found this session to be of assistance to you as you plan for the beginning of the fall. Uh, we know that many of you still have questions uh, that we did not answer during today's webinar. So please uh, look at the UCLA COVID-19 website, uh, www.covid-19 at ucla.edu for uh, copies of all the campus protocols, FAQs and other information. And if you don't find uh, answers to your questions there, please feel free to email, co uh, send an email to COVID-19 uh, at ucla.edu. So thank you all for joining and for all of your cooperation and understanding as we manage through challenges that are brought on by the pandemic, uh, as well as now with monkeypox. So thank you.